Uh, welcome this morning to CGCM. We will be continuing in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 31 today. Um, it's in your bulletin, uh, the, the page numbers in the blue Bibles, so if you need a, a Bible, go ahead and, and look, look on those pages. I'll ask you the simple question, opening, opening question, what I, animal do you identify with? Now, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, sometimes people use my spirit animal. That's actually taking part, uh, something in Native American the uh, mythology and beliefs and sort of misappropriating it into something that it doesn't mean. So when I say what, I what animal do you identify with, I don't mean spirit animal. I'm just saying when you look at an animal, you're like, yeah, that animal gets me, or I understand that animal. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a dog or a cat because your favorite thing to do is lay in the sun and be mean to people all day long. Maybe you see a sloth, and again, you're like, man, that animal gets me. Maybe you see like a really beautiful, like strong, like horse or like a tiger, and you're like, man, I wish I could be like that. I remember one time in elementary school, I did a report on snow leopards, and this is like elementary school, and I still remember facts about snow leopards. I love snow leopards, they're so awesome. And while I don't know if I necessarily identify with them, their fur on their tail is four inches long on like the top and the bottom. That's incredible. Like they live in the Himalaya mountains, so obviously they have to stay warm. But I love snow leopards, they're amazing. I love so many animals. I love my dogs and they're, and again, I can see how in one of my dogs, my personality is reflected and how in our other dog, uh, my wife's personality is reflected. Um, again, it's amazing how God has given us animals uh, to <laughs> see a little bit about his creativity. So as we think about this, if you were to ask this question, reading the Bible, is there an animal that God identifies with? Is there an animal that is used to describe God's creative power? And sometimes you might say, oh yes, uh, it's talk about God is like a lion. Or God is, Jesus is a lamb. And so I, you know, maybe that's how it identifies with. And so here is my bad joke for today. Did you ever think about that God identifies, or at least the prophet Isaiah identifies God as an owl? Because in Isaiah chapter 42, or chapter 40, verses 12 through 31, it repeatedly says, who, who, who <laughs> is like the Lord? Again, I know that, that's a bad joke. Uh, I apologize. And even the, even, the, even the eagle, excuse me, not the eagle, uh, even, the, um, even the owl knows, so it's winking at me. Um, so again, I apologize. And you know, we're talking about animals, owls. And of course, for those of you who know Lord of the Rings, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. Eagles play a major part in the Lord of the Rings. So there's my token Tolkien reference. Um, if you ever thought, why don't the eagles just fly Frodo and Sam to Mount Doom? I'll tell you after the service. All right, so there's, there's that. I was able to fit Tolkien in there. Uh, it's a good day, at least for me. Now I can go home. Isaiah, we are in this passage of scripture where it is a culmination of the hope of Isaiah. Chapters 40 through 55 are one long poem or you know, maybe a couple poems put together to tell the nation of Israel that they can have comfort that surpasses what they, are under, what they are currently undergoing because God is returning to live with his people. They are living in exile or warned about a time in exile where it seems like the gods of the Babylonians, the king of the Babylonians, is stronger than the God of Israel. But contrary to what it may seem, God is actually the sovereign ruler of all. And this is rooted in Isaiah's promise that one day God will rescue and restore his people. And so Isaiah 40 through 55 is telling the time, the surprising way that God is going to do that, to rescue and restore his people so they can have hope, they can have endurance, even though they may be suffering the Tempor temporary consequences of their sin. And so, like so many times in Scripture, when God shows up, people respond in song, or they respond in praise. And so, what is happening in this next section is a song of praise. It's a poem of praise to say, who is like God? 
And so I'll read verses 12 through 31. If you want to follow along with me on your own, you sure can. And again, here comes the who's. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on scales and the hills in, balance, in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord? or can instruct the Lord as his counselor. Does that sound like the song we sang, Behold Our God? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Or who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge? Or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They're regarded as dust in the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon isn't sufficient for the altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are regarded as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless, less than nothing. With whom, then, will you compare me? What God will you compare me? To what image will you liken him to? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, a goldsmith overlays it with gold, fashions silver chains around it. A person is too poor to present such an offering, so they select wood that won't rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol, making sure that it won't fall over. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the very beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught, reduces the world rulers to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown. No sooner do they take root in the ground that he blows them away, and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like the chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look around to the heavens. Who created all of these? Who brings out the starry host, one by one, calling them forth by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary or tired. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to understand your word today, seeing your great power, as well as the purpose of your power to generously share it with people so that they can follow you. We know, Lord, that there are many situations in our life that cause us to ask, have you forgotten us? Whether it's because of decisions we have made or just the world that we live in, help us to remember that there is no one like you, and with all of your strength, you are committed to us. Amen. Amen. All right, so I've used this illustration before, but again, just to use that description of who is like the Lord. The guy in the middle is a quote-unquote regular person. The guy on your right in the gray is a bodybuilder, one of the best bodybuilders in the world. His name is Jay Cutler. And so you can just imagine, compared to a quote-unquote normal guy, and again, you look at the guy in the middle, he's, he's very fit. He looks so small compared to that bodybuilder. But if you were to compare that bodybuilder, who spends all of his time making sure his muscles are in perfect symmetry, with strong men, people who are built like farmers, he looks like a seventh grader. No offense to the seventh graders in this room. The guy on the right is one of the most accomplished, strong men in all history. Zodrunus Savicus is his name, he's from Lithuania. 
So he is the strong man of strong men. And yet, even as those strong men are being compared, did you know that the beetle that is on the top left of the screen, the dung beetle, it's an unfortunate name, it can lift 1,100 times its own body weight. And so could you imagine a strong man with the proportional weight lifting ability where they can lift 1,000 times their own body weight? You know, those guys weigh like three, 400 pounds. And then if you look on the right side, there are those blue whales. Could you imagine the strength that it takes just for a blue whale to generate enough energy to move in the ocean? And it looks so effortless, way stronger than the strongest strong man. And then I'm not even talking about nuclear power, because I started to look into that, like what's the strongest force in the earth, and I started talking about nuclear power. I'm like, this is way over my head. So I'll just stick with animals and strong men. Aaron, can I have you come up here? I'm going to have Aaron just do kind of an impromptu um, sermon illustration for me. I'm going to have Aaron hold out his hands, and he's going to do his very, very best. And don't worry, I work here, so if something bad happens to the carpet, uh, I'll get blamed. And then I'll tell me somebody else told, tell him somebody else told me to do it. Aaron, could you put out your hands? And here we just have a simple cup of water. Don't worry, I haven't doctored it up with anything. So far, Aaron is doing a really, really good job. Uh-oh, it's spilling. <laughs> oh, boy. Aaron, I'm sorry, but you are not God. Because Aaron was able to hold about four ounces. You can just drop that on the there you go. <laughs> it's raining inside. It's a miracle. Aaron was not able to hold more than six ounces in his hands before it was able to start going, before it started dripping. And here it says in the scriptures that God is able to scoop up all of the depths of the ocean in his hand. He is able to measure off with a hand breadth the heavens. Again, my, my hands are like maybe eight inches long. You know, we, we use them to like, kind of like measure things. God is using his hand to sort of just hold it up here and say, I want the ends of the celestial, our understanding of the universe to be over here. And then on this side where my pinky is, I want it to end over there picking up all the dust and the sand and of the earth and putting it into a bucket. During COVID, when all the gyms were shut down, I went and bought sand at Lowe's and put it into buckets so I could use something to lift weights. And let me tell you, when a five-gallon bucket of sand gets halfway full of sand, it's really heavy. And here it is saying God holds all of this in his hands. There is no one like our God. It goes on to continue. Who can fathom the wisdom of the Lord? Now, if you know me, I like to ask a lot of advice. Some of it is because I'm a collaborative thinker. I'm, a, I'm somebody who likes to work with people. But in reality, it's just because I don't know a lot of things. And so if you were to ask me any type of scientific question, I would defer to my wife, Kathy. If you were to ask me any type of engineering question or computer question, I would defer you to at the risk of stereotyping, 90% of the people in this church, because 90% of the people in this church seem to work in some sort of engineering and technology field. I know that's not exactly true, but you get what I'm saying. So there are things that I just don't know. Could you imagine what it would be like to never not know something? Could you imagine what it would be like to ever be sort of at a loss where you actually have to ask somebody their advice? Isaiah says God doesn't have to do any of that. He doesn't need anybody to consult. Now, what's interesting in the story of the Bible, and I'll talk about this in just a little bit, that even though God does not need anybody, God loves to work through and with people. Oftentimes, we hear people who are just, they don't need anybody, and so they're fine by themselves. God loves to work through people. You might have noticed, and again, just the ways that it was describing the creation, it may sound a little bit different than what Genesis chapter 1 talks about, where it's saying God speaks things into existence, and then here it's sort of elaborating by him saying like he measures the things with his hands. He's using his hands to create or to manipulate things rather than just speaking them into existence. And then also in the book of Jeremiah, it talks about God through his wisdom creating the world. The Bible is so creative that even when it talks about the way that God has created the world, it paints different pictures depending on what it is trying to say. But what God wants us to know, and what Isaiah wants us to know, 
is that the world that God has created is good. It is purposeful, and it is a result of his wisdom and his power alone. You see, Isaiah was a scholar of his day. He was a professional prophet, which meant he would have been expected, among other things, aside from obviously listening to the Lord, but being culturally aware of what the other religions were teaching on that day. You see, in the days of the Bible, many times the cultures around them had very different creation stories, where the physical world that we see are a result of gods fighting and warring and killing each other, ripping each other in half so that their blood becomes the soil, etc., etc. And there is violence inherently tied up into the creation account because their gods are inherently violent or their gods are inherently unpredictable or warring. But Isaiah wants us to know, no, it's just because of God's wisdom. It's just because of his creative power. And again, sometimes what we use different ways to describe how God has created things. Sometimes we wish, oh, if only it would give us a, a closed caption security cam footage of what God exactly did, but it doesn't. It uses poetry to communicate what God wants us to know. So in our next thing that God compares himself to are idols. Now, these pictures are Photoshop fails. Like, you guys, you see the, the, the two guys on the right? They look really tough until all of a sudden you realize they have three hands. Like, they're supposed to look really smart and professional, but something happened in the Photoshop that, despite the fact that they tried to make themselves look so accomplished, so professional, so competent, um, th they have three hands. Somebody messed up. There is a huge fail when it comes to promoing these people. And the same thing with the swimmer on the left. It's supposed to be an action shot of them swimming, but just the way that their arm has been elongated and twisted, it just doesn't look natural. So it's like this idea that d despite of how much they try and dress something up, you start to see the cracks in it. You start to see the cracks in how maybe this isn't as awesome as we thought it was. And so Isaiah, especially in chapters 40 through 55, continually makes fun of the idols of their nations by saying, despite how you dress them up, they're nothing. I love it how he's like, you got to dress it up really good. You can't have it look basic. This is a, demo, this is a visible rep representation of what our God looks like. It can't, I'm going to use the phrase mid because I want to like show the kids, hey, I'm, I'm cool with today's lingo. We can't have our God looking mid for real, though, or whatever. And I realize I sound so stupid when I say that, and part of me saying that is to ruin it for everybody. So you're welcome. We can't have our idols looking like they're just little pieces of wood, so we got we to gotta overlay them with gold. we got to put silver chains on them. And also, when you're doing that, can you make sure to make them body he bottom heavy so they don't fall over? Could you imagine what would happen if the image of our God fell over? And maybe it fell over on the ground and it broke. Who will you compare the God of Israel to? An idol that you have to gussy up to make it look like it's actually worth your worshiping? Who will you compare them to? Now, you might notice that when I was talking about the created world, I didn't focus necessarily on that part about God calling out the stars. And that's intentional because the way that the ancient Near Eastern cultures thought about the stars are very different than the way that we think about stars today. Remember a couple weeks ago, and I know you all remember a couple weeks ago, when I said, when we are reading Isaiah, we have to do our very best to try and step outside of our culture and our cultural way of thinking and step into the shoes of a semi-nomadic, Iron Age people surrounded by different cultures who had very different understandings of who we were and why we are here. Because in those cultures, they had understandings of stars that were tied up with their religion. That the motion of their stars were actually representations of the gods that they worshipped. And so the motion of their stars when they went it helped dictate the communities and the cultures around them to say, oh, we should do this because the God that we associate with in our religion is moving this way, so he's calling us to do something. So we should, because of the stars, when we lift up our eyes to the stars, we should get a sense about 
who God is and what he, our God wants us to do. And what's really interesting about that story is that as we read that, we could say, we could look at it in our modern Western cultures and say, aren't those Iron Age people just so foolish and superstitious? But when you actually read the story of the Bible, you start to see a blending of things that might make us un a little bit uncomfortable. Because the story of the Bible is that there is only one God in the sense of there is only one supreme God. But there are lots of other lowercase g gods or spiritual beings that we don't always know about. And that sometimes God actually works through these spiritual beings. And again, this is one of those things when you read the Bible and all of a sudden you start to realize, this is not as safe as I thought it was. This is not as um, Western as I thought it was, where it's just me and Jesus and the Bible. But all of a sudden it starts to bring in all these other ideas about spiritual beings. And that's one of the things that God was so worried about when he established the nation of Israel, when he rescued them out of slavery. He says... In the book of Deuteronomy, it is going to be so important for you guys, as my people, for you to not lift up your eyes to the stars. Now, the reason why he said that is not because I don't want you to find out where the North Star is and use that as, you know, a makeshift compass. The reason why God told them, I don't want you lifting up your eyes to the stars is because I don't want you to start worshiping the way that the pagan nations around you worship. And then in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 17, where it talks about why God has finally allowed the nation of Assyria and Babylon to come in and conquer the northern and southern kingdoms, it's because, in, it says in chapter 17, it's because the nation of Israel lifted up their eyes to the hosts of heaven in addition to some of the other gods that they worshipped. Isn't it interesting about how the Bible uses this idea of looking up towards something or looking to something as a way of trying to find a sense of identity, trying to get a sense of understanding who God is and what he's called us to be? We look to something. And the Bible is always saying, you can look to what God has said is good and right and true, or you can look to something else and let that guide your way. And so when Isaiah says God calls out the stars one by one, he's almost kind of like winking a little bit. He's using a little bit of word play to kind of say like, hey, the stars that are like divine and the Babylonian and the Assyrians, all they can do is obey God too. All they can do is do exactly what the God of Israel has called them to do. Even the stars obey God. And I realized that as I said that, and I started talking about other spiritual beings, some alarms may have been going on in people's heads, like, what is he talking about? I would be really happy to talk some more about that. It's actually one of the things we talk about in our Thursday night group, as well as in our Sunday school class. So God says, who will you compare me to? I alone have created all things. Idols are nothing. Are you going to compare me with the other nations, it says? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust in the scales. Now, when we hear the Bible talk about nations, sometimes we might, again, just kind of think basic geography. We, th we see a map and we're like, oh, France, oh, China, Australia, uh, Bolivia, if we were to combine all those things, that's a lot of people, but compared to God, it's not a lot. But in reality, when the Bible talks about the nations, it's not just talking about people who happen to be here. It's actually talking about kingdoms and systems that can either obey God and join the nation of Israel, or they can rebel and re uh, reject God and attack their nation. So God is saying, who will you compare me to? All the nations that are around you that are actually attacking you and are actually conquering you, but compared to me, they are nothing. And it uses that picture, that illustration. I don't know if they had dandelions in biblical days, but have you ever seen those dandelions you pick up before they turn yellow and you, and the spores go everywhere. You know, the nation of Assyria, 
in Isaiah chapter 36, marched up to the walls of Jerusalem and said, here is a message from the king of Assyria. Who will rescue you from me? Doesn't that sound a lot like the nations of Assyria, Sennacherib's king, saying, who will you compare me to? I have conquered all the other nations that tried to stay, stand in my way. Similarly, in Isaiah chapter 14, it talks about the destruction of the king of Babylon. And it says, Babylon's king was so proud that he had this idea is that I will ascend up into heaven. Who is like me? And when Moses came and spoke to the Pharaoh and said, let my people go, Pharaoh in Egypt in the book of Exodus says, who is this God of Israel that I should listen to him? Who will you compare the Pharaoh to? And so for Isaiah to say that the nations are a drop in the bucket is not an account of necessarily the winners writing the history, but it's written from the perspective of people who have been marginalized, abused, and enslaved almost all of their entire existence. And yet they hold on to this language that who is like our God? The nations, the, the nations who worship the stars. And did you notice how so many times in the prophet Isaiah that when it's talking about God acting in judgment against Babylon and against Assyria and against other nations, it starts to throw in cosmic language about how the stars are collapsing, how the sun is going out, how the moon isn't rising anymore. We hear that and we're like, oh, the physical world must be falling apart. Some of that may be the case, but Isaiah is using language of saying this is so destructive that the symbols and the power signs of these nations, when God acts against them, fall apart because the nations are as nothing compared to God. Now, I, again, I realize that for the first part of this path, the sermon, don't, like, that's the longest part of the sermon, we're confronted with this idea of who, 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 who is like the Lord. And we're expected to respond to that. Now, some of us may be struggling with that because we see the world that's around us and the way that the God of the Bible, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is being described is he almost sounds more like a phys philosophical concept than a relational God. If you've studied philosophy or apologetics, Sometimes it almost makes God sound more like an abstract idea, the greatest conceivable being, the unmoved mover. And for some of us, we hear this, and it sounds like a distant God, the God who sits enthroned above the heavens, which we sort of associate with God exists up there somewhere, and he's not really all that concerned with what's going on down here in my life. And I'm not... I'm not a genius, but I think it's pretty accurate to say that I think all of us have felt that way in some aspect of our life, that God might exist up there somewhere, but maybe not down here. Maybe he's not concerned about the world. Maybe God's main purpose in this world is to let it fall apart so that we can go to a disembodied place called heaven when we die. And what do I do with my doubts and my fears? Maybe you feel that way. Maybe today you feel that way. You're sitting in this room. God knows this, and he preempts Israel's question. Why do you feel like I have forgotten you? Why do you feel like I don't know what's going on? If you, I, I asked this question to a couple people a couple weeks ago. If you had the superpower to either have the super ability to remember or the super ability to forget, what would you choose? It's one of those things where it sounds really easy, but then all of a sudden you start to think, like, wait a second. There's a lot of stuff in my life that I, if I could forget that ever happened, not in the sense of like I would go on continuing making those mistakes, but I've learned my lesson and I don't have to deal with those like waking up in the middle of the night type of things and be like, oh my gosh, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Or would you like the super power to remember? But again, the question then becomes, what do you remember? Do you remember everything? What about the things that you want to forget? You know, there's actually some people who, I heard about this on NPR, a woman who had this mental block, this psychological block in her life where she couldn't 
move on from the death, the death of her parents. Like she was constantly experiencing it as if it's something that just happened. The only thing she could do was remember. Now the reason why I brought that up is because God uses memory as a tool for his people. The nation of Israel is in the state that they are in because they had forgotten God. Not in the sense of, oh, I forgot God. Now my parents are here in this room. I have been forgotten at football practice, not once but twice. It's okay. I've moved on from it. I don't constantly relive it. But we know that sometimes things just slip your mind, and it's fine. It's okay. But for the nation of Israel to forget God, it's not like, oh, we forgot God that exists. It's, I choose not to trust God and his promises. I choose to forget the things that God has promised me. And so what is God's answer to this? It's to remember. He structures the nation of Israel's calendar around the idea of remembering how God has acted in the past and how he will act again in the future. The book of Deuteronomy, it says, when you are walking with your family and you're going down the street, talk about God's law. When you sit down, think about it. When you get up, talk about it. When you're on your your way, talk about it. The Psalms are constantly reinforcing this idea of remember what God has done. Not in the sense of remember how this is all your fault, You've made, you made your bed, now you have to lie in it. No, God says, have you not heard? Do you not know? And the way he's saying it's like, you have. It's asking a question with a positive expectation. You have heard. You have remembered. Isaiah 40 through 55 is the fact that God remembers his covenant promise to his people and how he is using his people to fulfill his promise to bless the world. To fix what is wrong, God is going to use his people. And as we go on in Isaiah 40 through 55, that that promise gets funneled down into a very interesting way that it's almost being done through one particular person. But in Isaiah 49 says, how could I have forgotten you? I've got your name tattooed on my hand. Now, if you ever say, Mom, Dad, I want a tattoo, and they say, no, you say, well, God has tattoos. I should have one, too. I want to be like Jesus. That's a bit of an exaggeration. God is faithful to his promise. God remembers his promise, and so what he wants his people to do is to remember his promise as well. God is faithful to his promise because Israel is experiencing the consequence of their behavior, their decisions, but God is also faithful in the sense that he is now going to bring them back and fundamentally change their hearts in such a way that he will break their cycle of forgetfulness. Wouldn't that be wonderful if the very thing that causes you to walk away and reject and forget God, God is saying, when I show up, when I bring my people back, I'm going to change their hearts so they can actually worship me. God is saying, remember my promise that through the forgiveness of your sin, God can work in you to show the world what it means to be a human, to be an image bearer of God. And God can work through you, even with all of your ongoing mistakes and mess ups, but because your sin is forgiven and because God's spirit now lives in you, he can use you as an example about how he is going to fix the world and the hope that is coming. God wants his people to remember his covenant promise. And so finally, we come to this idea of God's generous power. We had referred to this earlier. If you had all the power in the world, what would you do with it? You've heard the phrase, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. We've heard stories countless in number recently over the past five to ten years about all the abuses that have been going on in the evangelical churches in America about power abuses, about how men in power systems and structures silenced women and marginalized women who claimed that they were being abused and making women doubt themselves and making them feel like women who were violated by trusted people 
could not speak up because the men in power said so. We have to maintain the reputation of this community more so than honoring victims was the message. We've seen how the abuse of power hurts people. So what, God, what does God do with his power? If God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, he is the king of the world, he is everlasting, he never gets tired, what does he do with his power? He has the power to create. Does he have the character to care? He has the power to do all things. Does he have the power to care about us? Some people have framed it in this question. If God is all-powerful and he can do all things, why doesn't he end suffering? Well, if God is all-powerful, but he doesn't end suffering, that must mean that he's not loving. Or if God is loving, but he doesn't end suffering, then he must not be all-powerful. And they create this dilemma. And some of us sit in that dilemma, even as we trust in God, and we have those questions, and those are good questions to ask. I said earlier that God doesn't need anybody, but God loves to work through people. God almost seems to exclusively want to work through people. If you think about it in terms of how does God use his power, think about it in terms of this. What has happened when the nation of Israel has rejected God and chosen the other powers of the world? There's this line of theology and belief that runs throughout the Old Testament that when we surrender our created status as God's image bearers, and all the good things that God has created us to do to partner with him, to join with him in his, in his work, to worship him, to dedicate ourselves to him and what he's doing. When we choose not to do that, and instead we offer that power to something else, eventually what happens is that something else starts to consume and enslave us so that we become shells of humanity, some people might say. Now, I realize that that may sound very, very abstract, and I understand. But when God's image bearers surrender their image-bearing authority, glory, power, calling, and purpose to things that are not God, it ends up enslaving them. And that's why Isaiah says that the nation of Israel is living in a land of darkness. They're living in a land of slavery. God has said already in Exodus 19, I brought you out of slavery. I carried you out on eagle's wings, God says. And now you've sent yourself back into that. What does God do with his power? He shares it. He shares it with his image bearers. You see, the story of the Bible is not that God exists up there somewhere, like kind of just waiting for things to fall apart so that he can destroy everything. But rather, the story of the Bible is that God is so committed to this world that he actually sent his son into this world to show people what it looks like to truly be a human being in the way that we relate to God and that we relate to one another. And isn't it interesting that Isaiah chapter 4, he spends all this time saying, who, 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 who is like the Lord? He doesn't need anything. He never grows tired. He never grows weary. He never goes, gets faint. He never has to like rely on other people. And yet, all throughout the incarnation, Jesus demonstrates the opposite of that. Jesus grew tired. Jesus grew weary. Jesus had to rely on people to care for him. Jesus suffered. Jesus was rejected. And so if you ever ask yourself, well, what does God do with his power? In Jesus, you see that God, in Jesus, lays his power aside to take on the form of humanity so that the Son of God might know what it is like to be us. Hebrews chapter 4 says that Jesus became like us as a great and faithful high priest so that he could experience everything that we have experienced and yet be without sin. So last week we had talked, Pastor Ivan talked about how when we suffer temptation, we are not the only ones. Did you know that your God in the, for, in the person of Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted and not as like a fake out? Not as like a, yeah, but I'm actually not really tempted because I'm God. But there's actually like a real dynamic tension there. That in the incarnation, God shares his power by giving up his power. 
so that Jesus could show us what it looks like, so that Jesus could show us what it looks like to trust in the Lord within the limits of human endurance. You see that passage, it says, for those who hope, in some translations it says, those who wait in the Lord, they will have their strength renewed, they will rise up on wings like eagles, God is an owl, we are eagles, we will rise up on wings like eagles, we will run and not grow weary, we will walk and not go faint. He's using all these Hebrew parallels and extremes to just say every aspect of your life, from the exciting stuff to the mundane stuff that you have to do, like putting on your shoes, God will give you the strength to do that because God generously shares his power as an expression of his love. So how do we respond then? What does it look like for us to wait and hope for the Lord? Well, number one, it looks like we live our lives like God actually sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Now, that's Hebrew poetry. It doesn't mean that God exists up there somewhere. But rather, it means that God is the king of this world. And what God's priorities are, those are my priorities too. When I put my hope in something, that means I wait for this to come true. When I wait on the Lord, it means that I trust Jesus when he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who lift up their eyes for righteousness. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who, when they are persecuted, they don't strike back. Jesus said, you are the demonstration that God's kingdom is here, that God's power is actually working through you, that God's spirit has come and lived in your life because the way that you wait and hope and trust in the Lord isn't so that you can go and just accomplish all the stuff that you were gotten accomplished anyway, but now you need less naps because God's spirit is in you. No, the way that the world is going to see that you are part of God's kingdom is that God's spirit is working in you so that you can demonstrate God's life in your life. Because the Apostle Paul says, both in the book of Romans and in the book of Ephesians, that God's resurrection power that he used to raise Jesus now lives in you so that you can follow him. We talk a lot about faith here in this church, about how faith alone saves us. But sometimes what we do is that we treat faith as an abstract thing that we believe, that we put it in our pocket and we use it when we want to, and when we don't need it, we put it back in our pocket. But rather, the biblical picture isn't just something that we tick off on a list. But faith is allegiance. Faith is committing ourselves to God and his kingdom. So for us to have faith in God, it means that we live our lives like Jesus really is the exalted king in the universe. That we really do put his kingdom priorities over our lives. So that even when people may think we're weird, which they will, and that's okay, even when people may persecute us, and they might, and that's uncomfortable. I don't want that to happen, but God says that that will happen because what we're doing is that we are choosing through the way that we follow Jesus to show the world that we are waiting and we are hoping in Jesus as the resurrected king of this world who will one day come again and restore all things, not whisking us away to a disembodied place called heaven where we will exist in a shadowy spiritual world, but that where, where we are, on the new creation earth, will share in the glory of Jesus as his image bearers, where we will be able to rule with God over the new creation. That is what it looks like for us to wait and to hope and to trust in the Lord, even as the book of 2 Corinthians says, we're doing this as broken vessels, where one part of our body is glorious, is fading. But when we look in Jesus, the glory of Jesus radiates in our face. And so how do we know that this is true? Because God is faithful to his promise. He is faithful to the promise that we'll sing about in our song. That as he promises us in Jesus, he gives it to us through his spirit by trusting in him. I'll invite the worship team to come up and we'll sing a song in response. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your generous love and how you don't give gifts um, just only to worthy people, but rather you make people worthy by giving us your gifts.
that you equip us when you call us, you strengthen us so that we don't have to rely on our own strength, but through your strength we are able to follow you. Help us to live lives in our world, in our spheres of influence that show that we trust that Jesus is the resurrected king and that his kingdom priorities take root in our life to show that we wait and trust and hope in you. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.